Hey everyone, God bless you. Thanks a lot for tuning in. My reflection today, I've entitled Psalm 50. This is the Psalm of Repentance. Psalm 51, if you're using a scripture text that's not based upon the Septuagint. Psalm 50. You all know, no doubt, that the Psalter is the prayer book of the church. The Psalms were the prayers of the Old Testament church and The New Testament church incorporated the Psalter into the very heart of her worship. We love the Psalms and the Psalms are fixed in our hearts and on our lips. St. Paul says that we who are filled with the Holy Spirit speak to one another in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. This is the Christian life. This incredible Psalm is written by King David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, at a very important point in his life after he had committed a terrible sin, a double sin of adultery and then the worst sin of murder. You might remember uh, the circumstances. King David had been established by God's blessing uh, as the king of Israel and Judah. He had conquered the majority of his enemies and The opening scene, this is described in 2 Kings or in 2 Samuel, uh, if you're using a non-Septuagint text, chapters 11 and 12. He, the king, is pictured as being at home in his palace when his commanders and armies were out fighting Ammon. And that's our first uh, warning sign that something bad's going to happen. For us, we fall into sins when we stop fighting. There is no end to spiritual war until our death. King David was always at the forefront of his troops, always the example of bravery and courage from the time that he was a young man taking on Goliath with his slingshot. But here we find him at home while his army was on the field of battle. The next thing that the text says was that he was lying on his bed and he got up in the evening. What is he doing on his bed in the evening? In his laziness. And then he lost control of his eyes and saw a beautiful woman from the top of his palace. He looked down and saw a woman bathing outside. This with Bathsheba. And he summoned her. And you know the terrible story. He slept with her and sent her away. She conceived and informed him that uh, she was pregnant. King David then summoned her husband, Uriah the Hittite, one of his champion warriors, not just uh, a soldier, but one of the chief mighty men of King David. He called him home and sent him home to his family, thinking that he would sleep with his wife and cover up David's misdeed. But the man was virtuous and refused to sleep uh, in his bed with his wife while his combatants, fellow combatants were on the field of battle sleeping on the ground. And so what did Uriah do? He kept vigil. And David found out and summoned him again, and this time plumbed him with food and plumbed him with wine and sent him to his house again. And this time, even though the man was intoxicated, he had more virtue than the king had in his sins. And so David recognized he wasn't going to be able to accomplish this plan, and so he arranged for him to be killed in battle. And he wrote his commander, Joab, and had told him, bring Uriah up next to the city walls and put him in the front of the line so that the archers shoot him. And that's exactly what happened. And so in an attempt to cover over his sin of adultery, David became a murderer. And then the Lord God in his great mercy sent the prophet Nathan to David to tell him uh, the story of a man who had just one little ewe lamb. And that one little ewe lamb was stolen by a rich man who had a huge flock. And yet he was so greedy that he took this little ewe lamb. And the story infuriated David. And David was taken by his anger. And he said, that man should die. And then the prophet Nathan pointed at him and said, you are the man. This is the extremely important prophetic voice to those who hold power. This is why priests must always oh hello is it the president no it's not it's probably the wife this is why priests and prophets must always be able to speak 
to power, the word of God, the law of God. David humbled himself in the presence of Nathan and repented and wrote this incredible psalm of repentance that has become uh, the tool, the forming grace-filled tool to effect repentance in innumerable believers for the last 3,000 years. This psalm is the psalm that we recite constantly. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy great mercy, according to the multitude of thy compassions, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou may be found just when thou dost speak and blameless when thou art judged, etc. That incredible hymn has taught believers how to find salvation, how to repent. In fact, the church takes Psalm 50 and makes Psalm 50 the preeminent psalm in all of the services of the church. You know that the Psalter permeates all of our services. But of all the psalms that permeate Psalm 50 more than any other, let me just read to you where you would find Psalm 50 codified in the texts, so that if you were keeping the daily services, you would be hearing it constantly. Just imagine that you're a monk or nun keeping the full daily cycle. You would hear Psalm 50 at midnight office. In the third hour, you would hear it in Little Compline, and if it was in Great Compline, you'd also hear it there. You would hear it in Orthros if it was a festal Orthros, right after the Gospel reading. Why is it every Sunday after we read the Eothenon Gospels, the Gospels of the Resurrection, which are an 11 Gospel cycle, we read Psalm 50? Because as soon as we hear the magnificent words of Christ, as soon as we hear the voice of our Savior and are called by His voice to uh, the Christian life, our hearts are broken open with compunction and we immediately respond to the Gospel by saying, Have mercy on me, O God, and repeating the Psalm of Repentance, Psalm 50. And even in the liturgy, you would hear it. Where would you hear it? Well, it's appointed to be said by the priest at the most sublime portion of the divine liturgy. As the priest says the cherubic hymn, and the, the people are chanting the cherubic hymn, and the priests are saying, let us who mystically represent the cherubim and sing the thrice holy hymn to the life-creating trinity. Now lay aside all earthly cares that we may receive the King of all who comes to us invisibly upborne by the angelic host. Hallelujah. After repeating that three times, the priest and his concelebrants saying this, he then takes the censer and while he's doing the cherubic sensing, he says Psalm 50. Just as we come to that portion, just as we are beginning the anaphora, the priest recites Psalm 50 to prepare himself for the theophany that most certainly will take place for standing in the presence of God, for being overwhelmed by the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the holy table and upon the celebrants and the whole community to transform the gifts of bread and wine into the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, he recites Psalm 50. Just think of Isaiah the prophet when he had the theophany he experienced. He saw the Lord God high and lifted up. He repented in dust and ashes. He bowed low and said, I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. Psalm 50, dear ones, is that precious to us. Why is it that the church appoints this psalm, this famous psalm of repentance, to be constantly recited every day in the services of the church more than any other psalm? And why does she also appoint it in our private devotions? Almost all prayer books for Orthodox Christians have Psalm 50 uh, as part of the daily prayer rule that, it's, that our books suggest for the faithful to pray in their canona. Why is it? What is the church teaching us? It's a simple message. The life in Christ is a life of perpetual and ever-deepening compunction. The Christian life is a life of repentance, not just a definitive repentance at the beginning of the Christian life. That's for sure. The message from the church to the world is repent and believe. When those early believers heard St. Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost and they said, what should we do to be saved when their hearts were bound and convicted 
They said, what should we do to be saved? And Peter said, repent and believe the gospel and be baptized and wash away your sins. Repentance is the beginning of the Christian life. But repentance isn't just for the beginning of Christian life. Repentance and the deepening of repentance is the essence of the advance of Christian life. Deepening, ever deepening repentance is what we're being taught. The cultivation of brokenheartedness. The blessing upon those who mourn that our Savior articulated is what is the fruit of reciting Psalm 50. And of course, the more that you do this, dear ones, the more that you authentically pray Psalm 50 every day, joy and gladness will explode in your life. Think of what David says in the middle of the psalm. He says, he asks for a miracle and he gets it. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Let me know joy and gladness. And that's exactly what takes place for the repentant. The miracle takes place, the miracle of forgiveness and the bestowal of the grace of the Holy Spirit for joy and happiness. If you want joy in your life, dear ones, repent with the use of Psalm 50. I'll end with a beautiful word from St. Augustine. He says in his commentary on the Psalter, you know, the early fathers from the third to the fifth century, we have tens of commentaries on the Psalter. St. Jerome even told St. Augustine, don't write one. Don't write a commentary on the Psalter because everybody else has. <laughs> and St. Augustine did nonetheless, couldn't resist. And he says this on his, in his commentary on, this, on Psalm 50. He says, many have chosen to fall with David, but few to rise with him. Let us be amongst those few. Let us be the chosen of the Lord who don't just fall into sin, as we all have, but using the words, the inspired words of King David in the Psalm of Repentance in Psalm 50. Let us learn to repent and to be restored by the grace of God. God be with you. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to present a five-part lecture series by Father Josiah Trenum entitled, Sirach, Fashioning a Life of Wisdom. The Wisdom of Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, as the book is known in the Western or Latin tradition, is a choice composition from the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, written in the second century BC in Hebrew and translated into Greek by the author's grandson in Alexandria, Egypt. This majestic portion of Holy Scripture combines the rich aphorisms of traditional Hebrew sapiential literature with the concerns and background of second century Hellenic culture. Jesus, the son of Sirach, was highly prized by the church fathers from the earliest days of the church. In these five lectures, Father Josiah hones in on the themes of learning and seeking wisdom, humility, work, wealth, almsgiving, friendship, social life, wives, women, medicine and physicians, youth and aging, and wise speech and the power of words. In these topical lectures, practical substance is given to the practice of the fear of God in a wide array of human activity so that the servant of God may please the Lord and live thoroughly and thoughtfully before Him. For these and other available lectures, please visit our website at patristicnectar.org.